point to today uh, absolutely come up and, and discuss themselves. Someone who went from somebody who was curious about our organization to becoming a member and having an impact on the Senate in a way where it is integral to what he has now uh, as a successful entrepreneur. And um, I'd like to take the time to introduce Jared Guy Randolph, who's coming up. And Jared is not, has not only become a really close friend, but he is somebody that uh, has ascended from real estate broker to now having created his own fund uh, under KDR Consulting. And he's buying a lot of the stuff that some of the speakers in this group today are uh, building. Uh, but I'll let him tell you the rest about that and, and how it happened. How Ari has impacted uh, himself. So, everyone, please welcome Jerry Carter Randolph. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, um, I think Lori and Lisa always had it in the room. Hopefully, I get some seconds on that. Um, thank you guys for having me. Um, just going to give you kind of a brief on how Aria has helped me succeed and advance my level of activity and also in business. Um, I think it'll be helpful if I kind of give you a little brief history on myself. So I've been in real estate for almost 20 years now. I have a finance and development background, sold $2 billion in real estate. I had the fortunate opportunity to represent 13 new construction buildings in the city and also consult for over 20 developers. Uh, my focus in business has always been on the development and the commercial investment side of the business. And in Several years ago, I was nominated to Forbes 30 and 30 and the Real Bill 35 and under rising stars for my work in new development. The reason that is key is because I have a great network, I have access to amazing opportunities and a lot of experience. And I'm always looking for ways to elevate my business and my playing field. And ARIA has become an incredible resource for me in my network and has already created a lot of success. Um, it was about four years ago I was introduced to ARIA and I did a keynote uh, on the ultra luxury market in New York City and what was happening on the billionaires role row. Um, and then after that it was such a success and such a great time, I asked ARIA, guys can I be more involved? So what led up to after that was they had asked me to speak also at their Miami Luxury Summit and that was another very successful program where I met two key people who were affiliated with ARIA for several years that have helped me build my business today. Um, and what I want to do is actually give you guys some real-time examples and kind of quantify what ARIA has done for me. Before we do that, can we play the video? Is it, if it doesn't work, I'll add it. If it does, great. I'm Jared Randolph, founder of Headliner Series. Tonight's dinner was focused on busting the myths of negotiation, changing behavior, and closing deals in a challenged market. This is my first headline dinner as a headliner. I gotta tell you, it was an amazing evening to sit around the table with a bunch of other executives and talk about the business issues that they're dealing with, what we're dealing with, and be able to connect the dots between how we can help each other really be more effective in what we do. The opportunity to network and learn something is phenomenal. Today was about negotiation, and look, two takeaways just from that alone are be prepared and practice. To be able to get all of these different people from various parts of the real estate industry all in one room in an exclusive setting, the quality of people and the quality of the discussion is always unparalleled. Again, we got incredible people around the table, great networking, very informative, with amazing takeaways. I encourage all of you to stay tuned for what we have next with the Headliner Series. Um, so the reason that that was important and I wanted to play that for you guys was because as a business owner, an entrepreneur, a real estate broker, and looking for ways to elevate my business, I put together a series several years ago called Headliner Series. And it's a high level networking for brokers, executives, uh, in various fields, mainly real estate and finance, but we do some other creative and philanthropic fields as well. Tapping into our end, as you can see, having Dorian on the film has given me access to some incredible sponsors and also incredible ARIA members who were really engaged and have helped me take what was a little dinner party that we throw every few months we we'll take people around the table to uh, a program where we are bringing on a major corporate sponsor 
years, we are going to expand to do about 25 events next year. And we now have involvement from some of the major RDA players in what they're doing with the headline series. Another example is something I worked on with Dorian uh, called Real Estate Warriors. It's another networking program for advisors and fitness class. And from there, we'll have drinks, have foods about health, wellness, but also networking. That has a huge involvement from our group. One of the other things that I do, sounds like I don't have the time going today, um, is I work with the Real Estate Board of New York, and I co-chair a committee called NYRS, which is New York Residential Specialist, and we have started to integrate ARIA through our marketing and our educational events to have them involved in what we're working on. So with all of this said, my background, getting the sense of how I've connected with ARIA over the last two years, it's led to $30 million in deals for me with another $50 million in the works. And the reason this is key is because I have found someone, like I enjoy networking, and I'm part of a lot of programs. I started to kind of narrow that down and focus on programs and organizations where I'm seeing benefit. I cannot believe the amount of people when I go to the art events that are just open and welcome, welcoming, want to speak, want to connect, and I then develop friendships with and business relationships with after the ARIA events. So I encourage everyone in the room to go up, introduce yourself to someone get their card, have coffee, have lunch, and then see what you can do about their, their businesses, and don't be afraid to ask them to help build your business. So if you're looking for an organization, as I can see, you're all here and committed and involved to be a part of, ARIA for me is number one. Thank you, guys. Jared, and uh, I'll say no to the mayor, but thank you for it anyway. Um, so, Jared has obviously been impacted by Aria. There are others um, that have been as well, but I, I wanted to make sure to take the time to highlight Jared's experiences since I'm so near and dear to, to some of them and sharing those experiences as well. Um, so, thank you for that, Jared, again. I think the testimonials of Aria are, are truly important because uh, it is impacting those others. So, that, that is uh, a potential answer to those uh, members that ask me, you know, what does ARIA get about? I'd, uh, I'd like to take the time to introduce our, our next session. It's a fireside chat, and well, one of the hot topics that's out there in publications is opportunity zones. So we wanted to get somebody who knew a thing or two about opportunity zones, and uh, I'd like to introduce David Cole. Uh, who is the partner and chief strategy officer of Bridge Investment Group, uh, one of the largest and preeminent investors in the opportunity zone space itself. So we should know a bit too about that. And then uh, Greg Christensen, our very own Greg Christensen of WFG National Title Insurance Company, is its senior business development officer. It's, it's going to be interviewing him. So please welcome Greg and David to the stage. Housing. 
uh, senior living, uh, office where we could be value add, um, and real estate debt, and then our newest vertical, uh, our development fund manager, which is affected our office. Um, we, uh, we actually headquartered in Salt Lake City, we have offices here in New York as well as in Atlanta and Orlando. That's fantastic. So the, uh, the qualified opportunity zones were created by the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act to provide a tax incentive for private long-term investment in economic distressed communities. Uh, taxpayers may defer tax gains by making an appropriate investment in qualified opportunity fund. Let's discuss the basic investors you know about qualified opportunities. Well, first off, there's um, just under 9,000 opportunity zones throughout the country. Uh, every state selected opportunity zones. That process is in place between 2017 and 2018. Um, so what an investor can do is realize a capital gain and then take that gain, so it's different than the temporary one, and only take any of the gain component that's all they invested in an opportunity zone fund. And if it's invested in an opportunity zone fund, the benefits of that is you defer taxes on that gain um, until 2026, uh, assuming you've held the investment for that period of time. Uh, <clears throat> if you've held it until 2026, you are now you're paying 85% of the tax that would have been due in 2019. Uh, that's true if you've been held the asset for seven years in 2026. You can sell it after five, and then you would have to pay 10% less in taxes. Um, so there's that component of it. So there's the deferral of the gain, there's the reduction of the gain, or an earlier on sale. And then there's the, the really the juiciest component of it is if you hold the investment for 10 years, any capital gain from that underlying option is only one investment is tax free. So that's really the, the, you know, the, the way that our fund is structured and most investors are chasing this is you're holding these assets for 10 years. Any appreciation, frankly, cash flow, um, generally speaking, due to depreciation is completely tax free. So in order for the assets to be eligible for an opportunity, Really, a couple, a couple of key criteria. But the, the primary one is what's called substantial improvement, and uh, effectively means that uh, you've got to develop assets. You've got to develop assets the There are ways to redevelop. Um, you really have to double the basis in the building value in order to qualify. Um, but you know, and, and the simplest and the most common, so you know, we're doing almost everything we're doing is ground up development. Um, so if you invest in ground up development properties, hold them for ten years. No tax on that, uh, and appreciation in that investment, um, and uh, again, a deferral of your original taxes and a reduction in your taxes if you call it for these factors. So there's there's a lot of industry household names that have always qualified opportunity funds, you know, including Northfield, um, RXR, Seth Bates, Steel Sweet Street, you know, and that kind of thing. You know, you got Clarity Partners, you got Solar Capital. You have $18 billion in assets for the management of your size of an institution. You've been arguably the most active, or one of the most active, in the last year's deployment, over $500 million into your QOC strategy. Uh, what, has, what has been distinctive about your approach to some of the other platforms that are out there in the industry? Uh, and what is your, your overall strategy for, for geography? So, you know, each of the funds that you mentioned are a little bit of a different strategy, and, and, and I think ours has been more of a diversified geographic uh, strategy focused principally on multifamily housing. So, you know, in our XR, our field, they're you know, principally funding deals in the Metro New York area. Nothing wrong with that, just not for everyone. Um, you know, they're often, you know, just capitalizing deals that they already have in control. So, we're not you know, really competing with them on the deal side. Um, So I think that's the key difference between the RSRs and the portfolio and our fund strategy. Um, you know, uh, but away from that, we are focused on about 50 markets nationwide across the whole business. Uh, really all the core markets that kind of classic smile, including the high growth markets in the middle of Salt Lake City, Denver. Um, and, you know, we're very active in the Southeast. So our strategy really was to go out into our core target markets that were already invested in 
next to me, and I didn't know very well. Um, we had to sort of do some development, uh, not a lot of development, some development in our, in our value of excellence. But we really reached out to uh, operating partners in these local markets. Everything that we do is generally vertically integrated across our business, so we don't really work with operating partners or other strategies. But for QOC, our, our focus was really on finding good investable opportunities that were near shelf already in top tier markets. So, you know, we have in our, our first uh, our first uh, wave of uh, Series One, we invested five million dollars back to about one point two million dollars of projects. About eighty percent of that is multifamily. Um, we are in uh, a lot of the West Coast. We're in Sacramento, California. We're in Hayward, California, uh, LA, uh, Salt Lake City, um, Portland. Uh, we're actually here in Queens, New York. We're in Atlanta. Uh, we're in suburban DC. Our second strategy, uh, our second series. December, you know, similar, we've got a bigger project in Atlanta, another project in DC, uh, we've got uh, Long Beach, California, Scottsdale, Seattle. So generally speaking, high market markets, markets where we already have kind of a long-standing business relationship. Um, and uh, you know, we're really focused on sourcing, you know, more or less shovel ready or near shovel ready projects in those markets just happen to be an opportunity. So you have this great diversity across the landscape. So we're going to deliver you know, more of a traditional, traditional, more of a um, 
you know, creative type office product. Um, we've got substantial pre-lease interest so far. Uh, we've got funding system development. We've got plans fighting for it right now. Um, so we think it's really going to be a, a project that um, really changes the face of downtown Salt Lake City and does really accomplish what the QOZ legislation was set out to accomplish. Uh, and I'll, another thing I'll say is that there are, there are, you know, there are bad actors in the QOZ like there are really any any, any program. Um, you know, we have uh, we've tried to work within the law, but also within the letter of law, also within the spirit of the law. We're not talking about your housing. Um, you know, we are. You know, we're at the end of the day, we're profit driven. Our investor to focus on returns. So, you know, we're not going really more affordable than we're required to by the law. We are more really affordable. Uh, you know, we are you know, really improving the landscape, the streetscapes in a lot of these neighborhoods. True, we're moving down to Seattle, where you know, we're taking you know, what was it, an auto mall in, in, in Scottsdale, and we're in that into a real place with office and residential. So we think we're really making active improvements in these neighborhoods, um, and you know, and, and, and really leading to uh, you know, to long term growth in these markets. You asked about the differences. You know, I think the, one of the key differences, good and bad, is that we are holding these assets for 10 years. So that does change the perspective a little bit. Um, you know, I was going to joke that the one thing I know about a free or underwriting model is that it's wrong the second I see it. Well, the 10 year model, I mean, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're almost just guessing to a certain degree. But you know, I think that allows you to, um, to potentially take a little more risk than you would in the short term horizon. So you can look at these neighborhoods and say, Okay, it's not you know it's not man and man today, but you know three or four years from now maybe it'll be okay. If I have to sell three or four years, maybe I'm selling into a certain market. But moving out ten years, well, it's really hard to see how the path of progress is going to kind of pass this project by. It's got to be kind of right in the center. So I think that allows us a little more latitude to really look at. Um, I think it's allowed us to, to to really invest in some compelling opportunities where you know it might be two years away from a pension fund being able to do this deal because it doesn't take all the process. They're not going to do it as a build core deal. But you know, we have the, the ability to look out there and say, well, you know, if we have a 10-year hold, they then we'll be exiting into a much different model than we're going to that. So it does allow us to um, continue to I mean, take a, a more patient view and be more patient capital. Uh, you know, one way that we also mitigate some of the risks associated with that is we're generally using less leverage uh, you know, um, versus our our our, our properties and peers that make a little bit of 65, 75 construction costs. So we do do that to um, to somewhat mitigate the risk because you know again, 10 years, one thing I know for sure we're going to get a downturn at some point. Next 10 years, we're going to get two. Um, we know that we have to manage through that and just pull the trigger and sell the assets and we're going to an option because our investors are looking for us to hold it for 10 years. So so you may mention the possibility of bad actors. So in the past. Sometimes investment driven by tax purposes alone, such as the tenancy um, to, to, to take the loan. You mentioned that it was a little bit of a dynamic of overlap and leverage. But do you have do you have any concerns about bad actors, bad sponsors within the QOZ or QO funds at this stage of time? I think you know absolutely. I, mean, I think that I think that there are there are always there are always folks who are trying to promote deals that probably should get promoted when they can add when they can add a you know attack on top of those and it, it, it creates the dynamic where they can maybe get important and really So I do think there is some of that, but there's also a lot of folks trying to raise capital for one-off deals. And I think as an investor, you've got to look at that. You've got to, you know, you better be able to underwrite the deal, you better be able to underwrite the sponsor if that's something you're going to go into. Um, you know, our platform, you know, we are raising capital through Morgan Stanley, EBS. Wells Fargo, um, uh, Raymond James, but we've been vetted by some of the top tier wirehouses out there. The same is true of you know, our star, of uh, 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 <coughs> Brookfield, of um, um, Starwood. You know, so funds that have been vetted by the wirehouse platforms, I think you can you know, rest assured that you know, they've got quality control, um, and then you know, you're getting what you're paying for, so to speak. But when you're, when you're dealing with one-off sponsors, um, I mean, they may be very good, they may be able to underwrite them, they may be able to underwrite the deal, and that's fine. Can, but I do think there's the risk of putting money into deals that they probably shouldn't be going into just because of the fact. So, so you're raising the capital from wirehouses. So the, the economic innovation group estimated that between the U.S. households and, and corporations, they have $1.6.1 trillion dollars, uh, in underlying capital gains. The underwriting is tremendous. 
pool of potential capital level for your investment and the opportunities in this themselves. Do you think that the, the investors going, is it for the is it for the tax benefit, is it for the, the, the long-term appreciation, or is it social impact? What was the driving force for those people that invest in that? Yeah, I think I think there's a, a lot of I mean, I think the tax, the tax impact is, is the principal one that brings up most investors to the table. But I do think that you know, ESG, you come more important to our business, I'm sure, is true of most of you as well. Um, and there are a lot of folks that are very much focused on ESG components. You know, we have a separate workforce housing fund that is an impact fund. Um, you have the you know, bank for credits and ESG impact investors. Um, but you know, most of these distribution platforms have you know, uh, groups that focus on ESG for their high network clients. Um, so that has really generated a lot of attention and a lot of interest. I mean, we are, you know, there's a lot going on with the QSE regulations. I do think that reporting will be required in the two of the bills that, that came out uh, yesterday. Uh, I do think reporting ultimately is important and will, will, uh, will be implemented. However, we're going to voluntarily report and report on average metrics for our workforce housing fund rate the same thing with our strategy here. So I think we've gotten you know, a fair amount of interest from impact investors, but, you know, your traditional large impact investors are, are, are the foundation, so the neighbor is going to attack them and do this. So it really is, um, I think, like minded individuals that might have more so maybe donating to some of these foundations who are willing to use their taxable dollars and things in the strategy. So I do think it is important. Um, that's why I think it's important not just looking at the level of the law, but the spirit of the law, and ensure that we're complying with this. So there, there has been, a, I think, a really strong overlay of ESG um, on the interest of the fund. I think that has generated you know, a lot of. Um, a lot of, uh, of interest in the strategy. Um, but I think, I think without the tax impact, I think that, um, you know, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think we have, uh, we have much of a strategy at all. So I think we've got that number of data as the most critical component. And, you know, I think that $6.1 trillion number is a great headline number. I mean, there is, you know, not a lot of capital to in the strategy, you know, overall. This is a challenging strategy to raise capital for. Um, I think it's, a, I think it's, I think it's great. I think it will, um, will produce its, its intended consequences and our desired consequences for a lot of neighborhoods. Um, but it is not, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, back on the truck of 2040. It will be a very complicated structure, a very complicated product to invest in, in product to invest in and in 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 capital before. Um, so, I mean, I think at the end of the day, we've seen a tiny fraction of the overall dollars raised that were targeted. More money will, will, will come in over the next year or two, but um, I don't think we'll see anything anywhere near the, I'm not sure what the edge is also reported or the one from the report on total funds out there is like $50 billion. And I think if 10% of that gets raised this year, I think that's a shot. So do you see, do you see a rush for people to put capital into qualified opportunity funds to get the full benefit of your end? Is there a rush in the days of this year? I, you know, we haven't really seen that. I think it's somewhat foolish, you know, because, you know, the difference between putting it in 2019 and 2020 is 5%, and it's the smallest component of the tax benefit. Um, really, the, the biggest component far and away is, is, the, is the, 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 you know, not paying taxes or anything at all, um, and then the deferral is set. So, the additional 5%, I don't think it's worth making a rush decision to invest in the fund to take the 5%. Um, so, we haven't really seen but I think there are, you know, there are a lot of times that the investment trade is you don't always control your capital gains. Um, you know, there are you know, investors that are you know, getting K1 capital gains from their investments in private equity or other investments. Right, so those will come in at 1231 or they'll be able to go forward reporting. It's 1231 to 180 days from 1231. Um, if you sold a business, you've got 180 days from the time you sold that business. So there is you know, time pressure for people in the business. But if you're sitting on a limited position, then you can decide to sell now and sell later. I don't think there's much point to rush into a fund as a fall for anyone, and we haven't really seen that. Um, I do suspect that if, if that does ever come to pass, that'll be more um, at the end of uh, 2021 when you would then lose the ability to get any step up. The way the step up works is you get 15%, um, that ends 